the idea I want to, ex to try and discuss t this evening is how our environment is perhaps a little bit different from the regular environment we might think of. Um, so um, some people may think of icebergs or rainforests or farmland. Um, so I've chosen a picture that I think of as the environment as this fantastic sunny scene. And obviously there's people in the room here tonight who'll know that it, one of our best kept secrets here in Lancaster is that we are guaranteed over 300 days of continuous sunshine <laughs> every year. Shush, guys, everyone else will realise. <laughs> but actually, the reason I've chosen this picture is because really I'm wanting to talk a little bit about how our environment on Earth is shaped by the sun. And so images such as this, and the everyday experience we have of seeing the sun in the sky, could, could fool you into thinking that the sun is a constant. It doesn't change very much. It's always the same shape and it's the same colour, roughly. Um, so, so it must be a constant in the environment. Well, going back about 400 years ago, Galileo showed that that probably wasn't the case. Using the first telescopes, Galileo was looking at sunspots, and so we have here one of his sketches. And he could see these features on the surface of the sun that moved. Actually, the sun is a ball of gas and it's rotating, so any feature on the surface will, will move across our view of the sun. Uh, and he also noticed that the sunspots came and went. They had lifetimes of their own. And what we now know is that these sunspots are, in fact, areas of magnetic activity on the sun where the sun is slightly cooler than the, the rest of the sun, and so it appears darker. Now, if you chart these sunspots, you can see them quite easily. A bit of welding glass held up to the sun, you can see them. If you chart the number of them, which we've been able to do for hundreds of years, then you can start to see that the sun really isn't some constant f object. It does change. And so what I have here is a bit of data spanning about 150, 200 years of sunspot number. Literally, it is basically a count of sunspots every day for the last few hundred years. And the red line is actually that number just smoothed out with an averaging, just so you can see the trend. And what's really obvious is that the sun has seasons. There is a solar cycle of activity where we can count the sunspots, use that as a proxy for activity, and it goes up and down every 11 years or so. So the sun is really variable, actually on timescales from minutes to hours to days to years to decades. There are tre enormous trends in the sun. So how does this affect life here on Earth? Well, about 100 years ago, people were just starting to figure out what the sun was made of. Physics, advances in physics were helping there. Um, someone, the president of the Royal Society, did foolishly say that there were no more advances to be made in physics, just make extra measurements in greater detail. Um, and, and oh boy, was he wrong. Um, it went, we went on to figure out that the sun is actually controlling the Earth's environment in lots of interesting ways. Now, if we think of it, going back to that word environment now, if we just think of a, a pristine environment, let's think of an, an environment, the sort of thing you'd have in the Arctic. So let's have a look at this kind of video. If you think about those environments, one of the really stark things if you go up into this part of the world is that once the sun's gone down, some really interesting things start to happen. What we start to see are the lights in the night sky. We see the aurora borealis, or the northern lights, come out. Now, at about the turn of the 20th century, scientists had realized that, that these effects were actually something to do with an electromagnetic effect. Compasses on the ground would wobble around because there was a magnetic field being imposed on the ground, disturbing the, the natural background magnetic field of the Earth. And there was this, the idea was developed that this was an electromagnetic effect, and it was somehow linked to solar activity. And there were some debates about how this happened. And that debate really continued for the first half of the 20th century until the space age came along. Now, at the beginning of the space age, space scientists like me would have probably said that space was probably empty most of the time, and if you left the top of the Earth's atmosphere, all you got was the background magnetic field of the Earth, which got weaker and weaker as you went away, and it was cold and empty. And into this were launched those first satellites of the space age. And Explorer 1 was the United States' most su or su first successful satellite, and on it was a Geiger counter. The idea was to detect cosmic rays, energetic radiation coming from elsewhere in the universe. And so this idea that space was empty was about to be tested. And the reaction was this. My god, space is radioactive. This is coming from an engineer on the, on the Explorer 1 mission. Space was full of radiation. It's radiation. Space was full of energetically charged subatomic particles. And actually, measurements from Explorer 1 and subsequent missions went on to define a region around the Earth called the radiation belts, or the, the Van Allen belts. Uh, the, the Van Allen, James Van Allen was the, the principal investigator on that first experiment to, to detect the radiation in the space environment. And so lofting instruments up above the Earth's atmosphere gave us this, allowed, allowed us to have this really new insight into the space environment and the sun that was driving it. Now, 
What we then see is that if we look at the sun from above the Earth's atmosphere, we can make measurements that, that Galileo could only have dreamed of in, in unparalleled detail of sunspots. So we can study the sun's magnetic field. We can see how those sunspots change. Here we see a time-lapse movie of several days' worth of sunspot observation taken from Earth orbit. And we have a new understanding of how the sun and the Earth are linked together in this shared environment. And so if you try and sum it up in cartoon form, you usually end up with a picture that looks a bit like this. So the sun is burning through nuclear fusion and releasing material into the space environment. And just to put some numbers onto it, the sun is releasing about one million tons of material every second into the space environment. Now most of that is hydrogen and helium from the sun's outer atmosphere, which has been broken down at high temperatures into protons, electrons, and helium ions. So these are remnants of, of, of atoms and subatomic particles. And these stream out through the solar system. And our probes that have gone to the edge of the solar system can detect these right to the edge of the solar system. So you can smell the sun, if you like, all the way out to the edge of the solar system. And this is moving past the Earth at about 450 kilometers a second. So let's just think about that. We could get from Lancaster here in the northwest of England to New York in about 12 and a half seconds. That's how fast the solar wind's moving. And you might think space is empty, space is a vacuum. It's not. In the solar wind, at about the distance of the Earth from the sun, there are about 10 particles for every cubic centimeter. So if you think of a sugar cube size volume, 10 particles of solar origin. And just to make that in contrast, think about that sugar cube size bit of space at the end of your nose in this room. There's about 10 billion billion atmospheric particles in that sugar cube. Don't try and focus on them, you'll, you'll ruin your eyes. <laughs> now we're lucky, we live on a planet which has a very strong magnetic field. Deep in the core of the Earth, churning molten metal is generating a magnetic field. And so th this magnetic field actually shields us from the solar wind because the solar wind is magnetized, it carries with it the remnants of the sun's magnetic field into the solar system. And it can't get through the Earth's magnetic field very easily. And so we sit inside a little cocoon, a cavity, called the magnetosphere. And basically it's a bit like a rock in a river, the water flows around the rock. Most of the solar wind will flow past an, our magnetosphere. But some of the energy and momentum will leak in and can churn up and energize particles and magnetic field inside the magnetosphere. Every now and again, the sun gets a little bit violent, and local activity on the surface may throw out a big clump of material. It's sort of the sun is belching stuff into space, if you like. And that, then, is what we have shown in this cartoon, with about a billion tons of material being thrown out at a million miles an hour. And when that arrives at the Earth, that obviously has an effect on our, our magnetic field. So there's this complex system of electrical currents, of forces, of particles raining in and out, of magnetic fields, of electric fields that couple through the atmosphere from the Earth's core out into the interplanetary environment and ultimately along magnetic field lines back to the sun. One of the great things about TEDx events is there's no time for a quiz at the end, so I can't test you on this fantastic image showing all the different connectivities between the sun and the Earth. But one of those is the northern lights, those beautiful lights in the night sky we were looking at are because particles from the near-Earth space environment, energized by the action of the solar wind blowing past the magnetosphere, rain down into the upper atmosphere, causing it to glow. And it's actually oxygen. The stuff you've got in your lungs right now glows green and red when bombarded by electrons from the space environment. Those beautiful lights in the night sky, it's just some simple atmospheric physics and chemistry. So space age technology has really given us a grand perspective on <coughs> the Earth, and it's able us to look down on our civilization, the atmosphere above it, so we can predict the weather. Aren't we clever? We can start to understand the links between the Earth's upper atmosphere and the space environment. And actually, in these movies of the aurora taken from the ISS, you can actually see those tendrils of magnetic field heading up into the space environment, coupling our planet to the space environment around us. So we're really plugged into the rest of the solar system. So looking down from this perspective really gives us this whole new view of what environment really means. So you might be thinking, well, this is very pretty, but why do I care? Does it matter? Well, this attractive scene is the planet Mars. Now, Mars is our nearest neighbor. It's a little bit smaller than the Earth, and it's a bit further away from the sun. But that size is a real key issue because when Mars was formed, the heat of formation, the leftover heat after everything had coalesced together, was bleeding out much quicker than the equivalent heat bleeds out from the Earth. And it's also to do with the ratio of the surface area of the planet to its volume. So Mars cooled down very quickly, and the, the metallic core cooled down and froze and became solid. So it doesn't churn around anymore. No magnetic field to speak of on Mars. 
And so the solar wind, which gets diverted around the atmosphere at Earth, can actually get right into and attack the atmosphere at Mars. And the reason why Mars looks like it does today is because the solar winds had four billion years to attack the atmosphere and pick it up and take it off into the interplanetary environment. So the reason that Mars seems to have had no chance to develop a complex life forms, evolution is a slow process, is its atmosphere was destroyed because of uh, it, the accessibility of the solar wind to the atmosphere. And this is a key thing if we're looking out into the, solar, into the universe, looking for life elsewhere in the universe. We're going to have to start looking for planets that have a strong magnetic field, because that magnetic field is a shield that shields the atmosphere. And actually, the atmosphere is not only important for breathing, the atmosphere is, absorbs what, is what absorbs most of the nasty radiation from the sun, the x-rays and the ultraviolet light, that would be very damaging to living cells. So as a criteria for life, those pretty lights in the night sky are a really good telltale sign that you might have a planet that could sustain life. But back to something a little bit more, um, a little bit more everyday. If we think about life on Earth as it is today, in our part of the world perhaps, or in, involved situa in um, developed uh, societies, we're very reliant on electricity, we're reliant on GPS, we're reliant on satellite communications, both you, your government, the services you use for disaster planning, disaster relief, etc., etc. We're reliant on electricity grids, we're reliant on modern communications. The, you can't begin to count the number of times today you've used some technologies, some of which are vulnerable to the space environment. And changes in the space environment we now call space weather. So the space weather does change from day to day. And some of the technologies I've got listed on this graphic are sensitive to, to space weather. So satellites are above the Earth's atmosphere and struggle with radiation changes, as would astronauts. If anyone here in the room is an astronaut, you might want to think carefully about this. Actually, it also becomes an issue in high-altitude aircraft flights, especially over the poles. So aircraft operators, airline operators know about this. It can affect the communications with aircraft. It can even affect the power grid that delivers electricity to your home. And so industry is having to plan for space weather in the same way that they, they plan for bad regular weather, for snowstorms, for floods, for volcanic eruptions, for tsunamis. The natural environment is just another aspect of it. However, doing the actual predictions is a bit of a problem. And one of the reasons it's a problem is the scale. So we've had a few hundred years to, to practice measuring, understanding, and predicting weather here on Earth. And if we do that, I'm just going to create a little prop. We think about the atmosphere of the Earth. The volume of the atmosphere of the Earth, let's take all that atmosphere and we'll represent it by my balloon. Every day we launch 1,300 sounding balloons into the atmosphere to make measurements of the atmosphere from which we derive weather forecasts and like. 1,300 balloons every day we launch. Fantastic measurements. The space environment we're talking about, the magnetosphere, is 10 on this scale is 10 meters on a side. A cube, 10 meters on a side. It's enormous. And in that 10 meter cube, we have about a dozen spacecraft. We have a bit of a problem because there aren't quite enough measurements yet. So this generation of scientists are really going to have to work on this to try and establish the rules of space weather and how they affect us. And there's one really, um, one really crucial thing that we take, you've got to take away from this is that although the sun has seasons, which we saw already, if I overlay on this when the big geomagnetic disturbances caused by solar activity actually were over the last 100 years or so, you see that some of these spikes, the height of which represents the severity of the storm, actually, they don't fall when the sun is at its maximum of activity. They fall at other times. And that shouldn't surprise us. If we think about regular weather, then we don't always only get bad weather in winter. So you can have a great summer, but you can have a rainy day on it. Space weather is just the same. And so actually, there are some challenges. And to quote a philosopher baseball player, Making predictions is difficult, especially about the future. And so all I want to leave you with today is just next time you think about the environment, don't just think sideways. It's not all glaciers and rainforests going this way. Start thinking upwards, up to the top of the atmosphere and beyond, and all the way back to the sun, because the environment stretches out a long way from where we're stood right now. Thanks very much.